Okay, so we told you that simple linear regression was a quantitative predictor and a quantitative response. And multiple regression has quantitative responses as well. And so far we've looked at models where we had only quantitative predictors. But now we're going to talk about how we can incorporate a categorical predictor into our multiple linear regression model. So we're going to use a data set about roller coasters. So what do you think makes a good roller coaster ride? Well, lots of people are going to say the speed, the height, how long the ride is, whether it takes you upside down, we're going to call that inversions. Um, some of you might like mechanically accelerated roller coasters, the ones that kind of shoot you out at the beginning. Um, so we're going to look in the beginning at this data set. And again, you can download the data set called Coasters. It's located in Canvas along with your lecture notes. You can follow along in R. So do you expect the duration or the length of the ride to be related to the length of the track? Well, we're going to take a look at this. So I've created a scatter plot. Now it does look like there's a positive relationship between duration and length. Um, we fit a line through it through simple linear regression. And we could look at output from our regression. So I've pasted the coefficients output here along with um, the stuff underneath with the residual standard error and the and the um, R squared and whatnot. So let's go ahead and take a stab at interpreting the slope. Let's just practice that again. So this is just a simple linear regression, just one predictor, one response, so we can interpret the slope. What is the slope? 0 0.023. So how do we interpret that? Well that says for each one foot of track, we expect the duration of the ride to be 0.023 seconds longer. It's a positive slope, so longer. So what I've done here is I've multiplied everything by 1,000. We expect duration of a ride to increase by about 23 seconds for each additional 1,000 feet of track. So we've played that game before. That should be old news. Now let's interpret the residual standard error. So it's 27.3, we find that in our regression output. And what is that about? That's about the variability around the line and what's on the line predictions. So predictions of duration tend to be off by 27.23 seconds in general. All right, so we've got our simple linear regression. Obviously, if you're off by 27 seconds on your predictions, that's not really great if you're trying to adjust for line length and things like that. Um, lots of roller coaster rides aren't even 27 seconds long. So we want to do a little bit better. So let's think about the fact that when a ride has an inversion, like a loop or a corkscrew, something that takes you upside down, that is going to slow down the roller coaster. So maybe we could incorporate this categorical variable into our model. So let's take a look first at the same scatter plot that we started with, duration against length, but this time plotting the inversions with the red X's and rides without inversions with the blue circles. So the top line is the one that goes through the red X's and the bottom line is the blue line that goes through the blue circles. So what do we notice about this? Well, it looks like the slopes are pretty similar. They're fairly parallel. And it just looks like when you have an inversion, you increase the duration of the ride by a bit. So the slopes are similar, the intercepts are different, and for a given length, a roller coaster with an inversion lasts a little bit longer than those without inversions. So that's what we can notice from these separate simple linear regressions. Now believe it or not, we can actually incorporate this categorical variable inversions into a single model with our length as another predictor by introducing an indicator or dummy variable that, that indicates whether a coaster has an inversion. We're going to tell R to give it a 1 if the roller coaster has an inversion and a 0 otherwise. So I've gone ahead and coded this up. You, we did fit is duration till the length plus inversion. So that's the way that we called our column. 
in uh, the object in R and we attach the data set so we don't need to put coasters dollar sign in front of our names because that's what I did when I ran this. And we have our regression output here. So we've again got our intercept, our coefficient for length, and our coefficient for inversions. All right, so the multiple R squared, the R squared has gone up to 70%. The adjusted R squared is about 70% too. So it's larger than the than the R squared for the simple linear regression, so it looks like we've improved our model. Also, the P of values for both coefficients are small. And another thing is the residual standard error is decreased. Our predictions are going to only be off by 24 seconds instead of 27. So now let's take a look at how that indicator variable works in the model. So our regression equation is 22.39 plus 0 0.029 times length, I mean plus 0 0.028 times length, plus 30.08 times inversion. So what does this indicator variable do? Well, if you put a 1 in for inversions when a roller coaster has a 1, what does it do? It adds 30 seconds to your ride. It adds 30 to duration. And if you put a zero in, it doesn't add anything. So notice that we have two levels of the categorical variable inversion, yes or no, but we only need one variable to represent that because putting a zero in represents that baseline category. We're going to think in that way in just a minute, so I kind of wanted to foreshadow about it. So the coasters with inversions add about 30.08 seconds to the duration. And turning this factor on shifts the intercept upward by about 30 seconds while leaving the slope unaffected. That was that picture that we looked at with those lines that were fairly parallel. And this is consistent with the simple regression analyses of the separate groups. Now, what if a categorical variable has more than two variables? What we're going to do is the same idea that we did with our categorical variable that did have two. We're going to construct indicators by creating a separate indicator for each of the levels, but we're only going to do that for k minus 1 of the indicators. So remember, in our inversions, we had two levels of our categorical variable, yes or no, and we only needed an indicator variable for the yes, because then we could just put a zero in to get the no. It's going to be the same deal when we have more levels. We can put a zero in for all of the k levels to get that last level. So we're going to choose one category as a baseline and leave out its indicator. And then the regression coefficients are going to be interpreted the same way that we normally do, except for saying, instead of saying for a one unit increase in the x, we're going to say compared to the baseline, this is what it does. It either increases or decreases our response. So we've got a little example. We're going to be working with um, data that has months when we get to time series, but month has 12 levels. If we wanted to create, put, incorporate this into a model, we, some people might think that you could create a single indicator variable, like month is 1 for January, 2 for February, 12 for December, all the way through to December, but this is not recommended. So what we're going to do is introduce 11 indicator variables one that turns on and off the month of February, another one that turns on and off the month of March, etc. Now, if no month is turned on, then the model defaults to the baseline month January. You just put a zero in for all of those little indicators, coefficients. And obviously, you can put a one in for, Janu uh, one in for February and a one in for March, and that'll give you a mathematical result, but this should not be interpreted. All right, so let's work with an example. So the Texas Transportation Institute studies traffic delays. Um, data published in 2001 include information on the total delay per person in hours per year spent delayed by traffic, average arterial road speed in miles per hour, highway speed in miles per hour, and size of the city, small, medium, large, and very large. So how many coefficients am I going to get in my regression output? Let's think about it for a second. 
I'm going to have my intercept and then I'm going to have my coefficient for arterial road speed, for highway speed, and I'm going to have a coefficient for just three of the levels of my categorical variable. Because if I have one in there for small, one for medium, one for large, for instance, all I'd have to do is put a zero in for all three of those to get what the model does under the very large situation. So let's take a look at the output and talk about it. So here's the actual output. Notice we have an intercept, highway miles per hour, arterial miles per hour, small, large, and very large. So why is there no coefficient for medium? Remember there were four categories, small, medium, large, and very large. Well, three of them are in the model output, small, large, and very large. So that means medium was selected to be the baseline. And again, if we want to see what our output is going to be for medium-sized city, we just put zero in for small, zero in for large, and zero in for very large. So now let's practice interpreting the coefficient for small. Now, if this were not a categorical variable, we'd say for each one unit increase in city size, we expect um, traffic delays per hour per person per year, or whatever that unit is to increase by 3.59 after accounting for highway speed and arterial speed, right? But instead of saying increasing city by one, because we didn't put this in order, right? We're gonna just compare that small cities have on average 3.59 more hours than medium after accounting for the other two variables in the model. I hope that made sense. So traffic delays are about 3.6 hours per person per year larger in small cities than in medium cities after allowing for the effects of highway and arterial speeds. Now, just like in ANOVA, we can have interactions between our variables. So, we can test for it just like we did in ANOVA. So remember our um, regression of duration from length and inversions for roller coasters? Well, it looks like a non-significant inter interaction. The slopes look fairly similar, but we should test for it and check the p-value. Now, when we fit an interaction term in R, it's actually multiplying those two columns. If you were using Excel to do statistics, you would have to create that column where you multiplied each length times what's in the inversion column. Notice 1235 times 0 is 0, 2423 times 1 is 2423, etc. So that's actually what R is doing behind the scenes for you. You don't have to worry about coding that up. All right, so I've created the model where I did duration tilde length plus inversion plus length times inversion. And again, that should look familiar to you because we've already done interactions in ANOVA. So we've got our coefficients box. We've got our intercept length, the inversions, and then the interaction between length and inversions. So we can see that our p-value for the interaction is high. It's 0.6317. And what does a high p-value mean? We don't, it means we have lack of significance. We don't have evidence of significance. So it's okay to assume that the effect of versions, inversions is just additive. So what we were seeing in that picture um, is confirmed by the p-value. So then you can run the regression without the interaction term in the model and use the one that we started with, which was just length and inversions as predictors. Now, the example that we started with had the slopes the same, but the indicator variable can also account for differences when the, um, when the slopes are not the same. So we've got an example, carbohydrates versus calories for selected Burger King products. So we've got a scatter plot of our data, calories versus carbs, and we've separated the points. The red X's on top are the meat-based dishes, and the blue dots on the bottom are non-meat dishes. Now, if we wanted to incorporate meat into our model, this time it doesn't look like we have equal slopes. 
I'm suspecting that there's going to be an interaction. So just like before, we're going to introduce an indicator variable meet. We're going to make meet equal 1 if it's present and meet equal 0 if it isn't. Now adding the term meet to the model only adjusts the intercept. If you only add meet to the model, then it's going to assume those lines are parallel for meet and no meet. But what we're going to do is we're going to add carbs times meet to the model to adjust for the slopes. All right, so notice if meet equals 1, then carbs times meet is carbs times 1. It's just carbs. And if meet equals 0, then your interaction term is 0. All right, so we've got some output here. Notice that the predictor meet is not significant with a p-value of 0.79, but the carbs times meet is significant with a p-value of 0 0.0012. So remember that in the presence of a significant interaction, we cannot remove this main effect meet just because it has a high p-value. I just wanted to point that out. But the low p-value on carbs times meat does indicate that we have a significant interaction between carbohydrates and meat. All right, so now we can build the regression equation. So what is it? 137.395 plus 3.93 times carbs minus 226.16 times meat plus 7.87 times carbs by meat. And we have our regression equation, and that's our estimate of calories. So again, we're still only plugging two things in when we make predictions, carbs and meat, um, but we just have another term that includes both of those in it. All right, so now let's look at what happens when we have zero for meat. Let's find the intercept and the slope. So I copy down my regression equation, calories, estimated calories is 137.395 plus 3.93 times carbs minus 26.16 times zero for meat plus 7.87 times carbs times zero for meat. So notice that we put the zero in everywhere there was meat in our original equation. And when you take anything times zero, they go away. So you're just left with the first two terms, 137.395 plus 3.93 times carbs. Notice the slope is 3.93. So now let's do the same, play the same game for meat equals one. We're going to start with our regression equation, plugging 1 in for meat this time. So we've got it on the meat term, and we've also got it on the interaction between carbs and meat term. And so this time, we're going to combine the 3.93 carbs plus the 7.87 carbs to get 11.81 carbs. And we're going to combine our two um, constants, 137.395 minus 26.16, to get an intercept of 112.24. So when meat is 1, our, stope, our slope is much steeper. It's 11.81 rather than when meat equals zero, it was 3.93. And we can see this in our picture of our separate regression lines. When, when meat, on the meat, the meat line is much steeper and the non-meat line on the bottom is much more flat. So that's how the math works out with the picture. All right, so. Now let's give you some final notes about interactions. We've introduced the notion of an interaction using a model with one quantitative and one categorical predictor. However, an interaction can occur between two quantitative variables too. If the interaction is not significant, you can remove it and rerun the model without it. But if the interaction is significant, the terms of the interaction must stay in the model even if their individual p-values are not significant.